Welcome to the Anime Podcast. Uh, today we're moored just off the fifth circle of hell, where we're watching as Prince Andrew is lowered in a diving bell. He's trying to resuscitate a ghostly and cursed Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, with me is William for the first time. Hello, how are you? Uh, so today what we're going to do is we're going to be talking about the current French strikes and the Irish election and a bit about uh, the royal family. Uh, which is apropos as we watch Prince Andrew resuscitate a bloated corpse of Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, so enjoy that. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the current uh, and long uh, running strikes in France that have been going on since the beginning of uh, December, I think it is now, or maybe earlier, um, on the issue of um, pensions. Uh, in France, uh, they have an interesting system. They have about 42 different for, uh, kind of pensions uh, regimes, I suppose, whatever they call it, uh, that covers uh, all sorts of different um, uh, careers. So from ballet dancers to uh, policemen to uh, railway, subway workers, you name it. Uh, Macron um, proposes having a kind of point system for everybody or that was his original plan, everyone in the state that you pay in, points go in at the end of it uh, 64 I think was going to be the new yeah, the uh, new time. 62 yeah, the new 60, 64 uh, was to be the new uh, retirement um, and he was also saying that no longer would there be a situation that somebody would be earning the maximum they made during their life for their pension Yeah. now it, it should be said that uh, Again, people have different views on this in terms of how much someone needs to actually survive for pension, but various uh, figures have been bandied around. You need a lot more, let's just say, than is be than most. Certainly, Ireland, the amount of the state pension is is ridiculously small, and it's uh, not certainly not enough to pay rent if you're rent uh, in rented accommodation at the Famously time. Cheap Famously cheap, but just cheap. it's fourteen hundred euros nationwide is the average. Uh, in Ireland, in Dublin, it's over two hundred two grand. Uh, so again. Um, that's what's going on at the moment. The strikes have been going on. The I think some of the first days they had upwards of 1.8 million people. Um, the main union, I think these days it's about just under 50% of workers are still out. Uh, they seem to be getting major support from lawyers, professional class. Macron, very unpopular. And so uh, he's proposed uh, to not increase the, to 64 uh, that's the latest concession he's proposed, uh, but what workers are still on strike last time I checked, uh, the, uh, on date of recording. So, uh, what do we think of this, is, is what we're going to talk about here. Is it a repeat, or rather, of the strikes in the 1980s, which were the largest strikes France had seen until since the 1960s, the famous May Days in 68? Or is it just something which is, uh, is it something, the beginning of something in France, of a new kind of power of the labor unions uh, and what we should all be patting ourselves after? Is it just a fluke? Is it something that, you know, older people or people are approaching uh, uh, pension age or just getting, like, let's stand up to this now and it's just a passing thing? Or is it part of something larger, something connected to the, um, the Yellow Jacket movement? Will, what do you think? Uh, well, like, having a... I did a wee bit, a wee bit of uh, background reading around this today, um, knowing that was coming here. Um, I think there was some sort of compromise proposed, which you'd mentioned about um, scrapping the idea of like raising the state pension age to 64. Um, as I understand it, probably wrong, um, the reason the strikes are ongoing is that it's like a resistance um, to the overall reforms that Macron has been proposing, um, bringing in, obviously, like he's trying to like invoke or like impose a bunch of neoliberal reforms yep. they always call them reforms they mean like you know cuts mm. and 
um, guttings out of. Billy reforms are lovely positive words, so we use that word yep. instead. Um, proposing a bunch of reforms to the state pension. Um, this was like massively benefiting people in the private sector. Mm -hmm. It was massively benefiting insurance firms as well. Um, I think our French minister had to resign. He did, yeah. He, uh, <laughs> he was like the like the minister for pensions. Mm. I mean, it was something like directly obvious like that, and it turned out he had like a bunch of shares and was best <laughs> friends with like loads of like pension companies mm. who were obviously not happy that they had to pay out these like pretty. Um, they weren't even great. They were just decent pensions. Yeah. Um, the New York Times kept on referring to them as generous. Yeah. Um, and they kept on putting in scare quotes. Um, but they weren't. They were just like you know, what you'd like enough to grant you a dignified life. Yeah. So um, I should I should ask as uh, Will is is may or may not be an economist. May, so, or, may, not not be an may or may not be. He could be either. Um, <laughs> how much do you think on average a person needs? Uh, if they live a normal length of a life, so for men in France, I imagine mid to late eighties or something like that, maybe less. Um, how much would you need if you were not working after the age of sixty-four? Let's say they changed it or to actually survive that amount of time in terms of so like a, a some like a total yeah year. some how much do you think you would actually well, like need how to, much per year no in total in total I'm not really sure or every so year like, or every year so like I'm a monetarist type of econo like economist like so. Yeah. Um, I don't really know much about pensiony type things, um, but like say what the age is 64, 65 years old. Uh, so like say, you, unless you're Scottish, mm. you're gonna like live until you're 80 or something. If you're Scottish, yeah, you're 56. You've died about 10 years. <laughs> Which years case, it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you're dead at 56. No one gets a pension in Scotland. They're all dead at 47. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. So like say what 20 grand a year mm. um, times 20 is what. There was a joke Frankie Boyle once made, which okay. was like he said uh, the average age of uh, the average uh, uh, life expectancy in the Kelton, which is part of Glasgow, is fifty six, and he said for most people in Kelton that's quite a long time actually to live. <laughs> that is a bit too much. You know? Yeah. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, um, you've kind of like you've outstayed your welcome at the age of fifty six. Yeah, yeah especially in the Kelton. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the basically this is the same thing. Pension reform for people again sounds a very innocuous term. Uh, the benefits of having somebody who knows yeah, our market. Yeah, we're cutting it, we're reforming it. We're well, here's it the thing. There. If you say to somebody, we are not going to give you your pension for an extra... So my mum um, uh, turned 65 recently. Um, she's not getting a pension because a while ago, ago they put put it up to 66. Other countries have moved it up to 70 in some cases. Yeah. Now, what that actually means is that you're not any more employable at 65 than you were before. It's very, very... Ageism is a huge problem in terms of work. The amount of people unemployed over the age of 50 or become unemployed over the age of 50 is, is very large and they cannot find work. They have to go on the dole. Dole office is required in Ireland to try and get you into work, which means they will be badgering you. The amount of money you get on the dole is much smaller than the pension, state pension, which again is not even that much. No. So they are literally putting your hand in your pocket and taking money out. That is what pension reform means. It's not like, oh, you'll be fine. You're you're healthier in most generations. Well, we'll, we'll leave that to the side. It's not like you're going to like retrain at the age of 50 either, right? So like, Who the fuck is going to retrain? No, you're not going to go back to you need to yeah. do a degree in computer science so you can go work yeah. at Google. There were, yeah, there was a thing that people said. Well, that those who want to make you work till seventy are the same people who who won't employ you after fifty. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's leaving people in the dull, and it's badgering them, and it's portraying them as somehow you know criminal for not being employed. People lose their fucking jobs. Businesses go out of business. It happens, and for a lot of people, it's very very difficult to get work. Even in people late people in the late forties, I imagine they go. Eh. Why I don't know. I mean, some people were work their best when they're in their later years anyway. But anyway, the point is. So in France, this is Macron saying, you know, the post-war consensus, which gave France one of the best healthcare systems, one of the best social security systems in the world, and was an agreed upon, okay, this is a, is a compromise between capital and, 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 again, like with Britain, the difference is they kept it, unlike Britain, <laughs> um, is a threat. Now, who is Macron? Macron is somebody with his own marche, I think that's their president, group, who says, I'm neither left nor I'm right. He's basically the Tony Blair. The radical centrist. He's, well, <laughs> he's the Tony Blair of French politics. He's just having none of the same luck. Is now, that slander? Does that count as slander if he calls yes, someone the absolutely. Tony Blair? Oh, man. The war criminal of France. <laughs> <laughs> that could be any number of different people, yeah, actually. Podcast lawyers there that's a, there's a lot of them. Um, and he, his proposal is, oh, I can balance the books. Which I uh, now one of the articles we read to prepare for this suggested that if this is not brought in, there'll be a deficit of nineteen, 19 billion. billion. Yeah, 
Now, I don't know enough about that, so that I'll have to turn to Will to say, is there any truth to suggest that they need to reform their pension system if nothing else changes? 19, 19 billion sounds like a lot. It's yeah. not that much. Yeah. Um, in the UK, if you had a deficit of 19 billion, you could just print more money because they keep your central bank. Uh, the ECB will probably not give France 19 billion to like, pay to pensioners mm -hmm. um, because the ECB are really keen on austerity as we saw with Greece yeah. um, they're not keen on like state intervention at all or uh, the state supporting things when businesses should be doing it yeah. and the ECB are just going to want to say well you clearly have a problem with your pensions reform them and um, everyone should have a private pension which is exactly what they did in the UK pretty mm. much um, all employers are now obliged to give their workers a private pension mm. um, which you know it doesn't take a genius to work out the plan is to abolish the state pension in the UK yeah. in about 20 or 30 years time, not even that long probably. Um, but that is exactly the mechanism the ECB will be using in France as well. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a shitty move. Um, yeah. The way they're reforming the pensions is like taking over, like you're, you were saying, the lifetime point system. If you are unemployed for various parts of your life, you're going to accumulate zero points. So yep. you might not qualify for like a half decent pension if you've gone five, six, seven years unemployed. Hmm. Um, at the moment, I think it's, if you're in the public sector, it's the last six months. If you're in the private sector, it's the last yeah. 25 years, an average over the last 25 years. And it should be said that as the uh, economy changes so that you are having longer periods of unemployment, switching between jobs, the likelihood that this is, will impact yeah. you in France. No is, one stays in the same job for 25 no, years. Not no, anymore. Like, no, no one does that. Maybe someone working in the subway, but I think mean, the subway unions and the railway unions are the most Pretty strong. Yeah, in France and good for, good for them. Yeah, um, definitely. If anything, this seems to suggest that again, France is 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 always seen as unique um, in Europe because of its history, because it had so many revolutions over the years. It's got a culture which is more again they say more conducive to this. I mean, again, the older I get, the more I think it is a there is an element of cultural thing that it's kind of a Max Weber. Uh, Protestant work ethic thing, you know, that there's a, certainly a cultural element to why certain societies develop the way they do. Why is it in Ireland that even though we have a, uh, a trade union movement, it's it's completely unwilling to uh, to actually come out Challenge against the state. Not at all. Um, and the one in Britain, unfortunately, did, and it was smashed by Thatcher in the process. The, certainly, the miners' unions were smashed. So again, you and again, you have an economy now which is crying out for some type of collective um, action. Um, and France, this still exists, uh, long may it continue. Um, is this a sign of things to come? Uh, who knows? That will, I suppose, we'll find that out as when things do, when when in in hindsight, um, it's certainly a good sign. I, I think people need to, uh, if they're not already a member of the union, they need to fucking join one. Uh, and if you can join the international workers of the world, uh, who are one of the few decent uh, groups that exist in multiple countries and are the proper syndicalists, you know. But I think in the end, it'll probably be, uh, it could be a sign of the re-emergence of unions. It could also mean nothing. It could just be the pension thing is a particularly uh, a sore spot. It's good that you mentioned like the IWW. Um, they're like one of the unions that protect precariat workers right like workers in precarious labor like uber workers or delivery people or absolutely you've got, yeah. delivery, you've got delivery now in of course we do yeah uh, you don't have amazon over here like so <laughs> i find that really strange we do have amazon um it's amazon uk you've got oh well we'll probably have amazon ireland eventually like one I'm, day that's the dream right <laughs> makes the dream work yeah, um oh, i can see it happening there's a lot of disposable cash in ireland because of so many people not being able to afford housing. <laughs> yeah it's great um someone told me that the reason amazon don't trade here is because it have to pay tax <laughs> so if you like you have to like pay tax on the sales you make in a company yeah um if you trade in that country and yeah amazon don't trade in Ireland, so they don't have to pay tax here. So they just register their business. Uh, right. Like in a, where is it? Jersey in Ireland, right? So yeah, yeah. That that was the reason given. It's probably false. that's insane. But they're actually based here. Yeah. There's, there's Amazon in Cork. We I saw their plants. Amazon Cork. There you go. That's that insane. Amazon.ck. The Republic of Cork. The Republic of the Cork. Republic yeah. Of Cork, yeah. The Ra is running it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By gunpoint. Um, for Amazon. It's for Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'd have more respect for them if they were Republicans. Um, 
well, not those, not American Republicans. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, the the French strike thing, uh, we'll have to see how it resolves itself. I can only hope that it's 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 a sign that um, there is still some desire to preserve uh, the welfare state in Europe. I mean, I was just over in um, the Netherlands, uh, where you can see how society can be so much more bearable uh, if there's just basic, basic things work. So... I mean, it's, it's not even a public transport thing, but everyone fucking cycles everywhere in, in the Netherlands. I think 80% of people get from A to B via cycling, which is yeah, great. It's fairly flat and you've got decent infrastructure. Yeah, you have, you, but, but even if you didn't, everywhere is connected with the train lines. Again, it's a small state, but I, I went to Germany last year. Everything is connected. Every it's small... the size of Ireland, right? What, Germany? <laughs> no, uh, the Netherlands. Yes, it's not... And we have a larger GDP per head of population than they do. Okay. So they have 17 million people, we have 5 million people. We have a larger GDP per head population, and yet we get fucked over. Uh, and I imagine it's the same with France, although I've not spent so much time in France. I know it's the same in Germany, where, again, people kind of don't ask for things. They don't feel the need to stand up and say, no, I, that's a bare minimum. Ireland has a fucking terrible public transport system, just truly abysmal. Yeah. Um, the, so where we are right now is the fifth circle of hell but when we're not there sometimes we're in dublin i had to get the bus to the fifth circle of hell and you informed me there was only one every hour <laughs> yes I, yes i could not believe this yeah it's it's insane it, and, and, and unnecessary um there is more than enough money in ireland even with our tremendous we were like we're a tax haven for for shitty multinationals but even with the money that comes in there's enough money there uh, the government gives it away. The government's not interested in doing any of these things. Um, and and they get away with it because people don't expect uh, anything. I mean, public transport doesn't even cost anything, right? Like, yeah. you get people to pay for it. Yeah, and like, it's not even a Catholic thing. It's not a Catholic thing. It's, it's not, not a Catholic. British thing. But here's the thing. It's not a Catholic thing. Go to Spain. Excellent public transport. Yeah. Go to Italy. Excellent public transport. Go to Portugal. Excellent public transport. Go to France. Excellent public transport. And there's nothing to do with Catholicism. Yeah. Even Britain has fucking better public transport than we do. So it's not the fact that they were used to be over here. It's a fucking Irish thing. It's because we don't give it... We're, we're too frightened and intimidated that these people will leave. Um, again, it's not even that. It's the money, the tax base we actually have now, even as a tax-avoiding scumbag country, is enough to do a lot of these things. It's not... Where are they even going to go? Like, They're not going to go back to the UK, right, because of Brexit? No. They might go to Singapore. They speak English. Yeah... Wouldn't they like a haven in Europe though? Like, isn't that the thing? Like, they kind of like Netherlands. In Europe. Netherlands, Netherlands yeah, has a pretty good tax call. rate, and they have excellent public transport. They all speak English. Uh, Ireland's leaders are. I mean, I was reading this thing the other day that half of our corporation tax that we get in, which is spent in fairness on certain things, is probably mostly paying off the debts we owe to uh, everyone. The, to everybody. <laughs> um, is very precarious. It's shadow or companies or banks, whatever these groups are called. They have various names. Um, and not reliable to be there in 10 years' time. Um, but still, even if you remove all of that, there's still a huge tax take, and more than enough. I mean, Ireland was dirt poor. I think we had a GDP of like, I don't want to say like a billion. It wasn't a billion. It was like, I don't know, like a million or something in the 1930s. Some really ridiculously yeah. small number at the time. And yet we built, you know, 30 plus thousand public housing units, we had, you know, state intervention in the economy. Now, again, we could have done way better, but we were coming out of a situation where Britain had made us quite literally a cash cow in the sense that we were exporting all our fucking live cattle and the agricultural goods. We've been molded into this thing where we exported cheap labor, or ourselves, and our cattle over to Britain. We were the uh, granary, if you will, and remained so until the 60s and 70s when we began to change our economy into becoming what it is today, encouraging foreign direct investment. The point is, like, all those things happened, and they're not great, and it's not... It's not we're not France. We don't have the same level of... of of a culture of, of, of revolutions working, and uh, maybe not working immediately, but working eventually, uh, being a great power that gives you a sense of confidence. So certainly we don't have that. But again, there are other countries who had this history that do not, um, who have fucking basic public transport and, and, and or have basic healthcare. Basic public services. Yeah. Basic public services. So there's something weird probably about Ireland that, 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 that we don't do that. And you can all make your minds up as to why exactly that's not the case. It's a million different answers to why that is. But you can see that in France, when people put their mind to it, when unions exist and they're strong, and even if half of them, even if 50% of the workers come out, you can have results. You can stand up to power and they do back down. That's as simple as that. 
You can be cynical in the pub, and that's where it's going to stay. You're going to bitch and moan at the pub, and nothing's going to fucking change. Um, or you can fuck off to Canada, like Meghan Markle. Uh, <laughs> and in which case, good luck in Canada. Um, but you better be a millionaire there, too, because... The problems are consistent uh, everywhere. They're not. Situation isn't the same everywhere. Exactly. You live in France, the be- best public healthcare system in the world, according to statistics. Some of the best public transport, but you are still facing the same issues. That's Cuba about- had the best public healthcare at one point, right? Cuba. Yeah. I think they had the best in North Amer- in America or in the Americas. Really? I mean, maybe they did. I thought it was the world. Yeah. Because oh, they export okay. more doctors than anything else. I think they export them mostly though. In no, terms of like per population, over. like correct yeah. population. Like there, hmm. there was like the Ebola crisis and things. <laughs> uh, crisis. Loads of them were like Cuban doctors. Yeah, yeah. They're just incredibly highly trained. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the argument that it's a cultural thing that France has had 200 years since 1789? I mean, you guys have only had 100 years since, well, just slightly more than 100 years since 1916. True. In 1926. Yeah, the but... The thing I find but, amazing about the Irish yeah. is you guys love and argue, like absolutely love and argue. You, you're love so and most, argue? Like an argument? Yeah, like you'll, you'll stop and like... <laughs> If I say black, someone else will say white, and then we'll get uh-huh. into it, you know. Um, but when it comes to politics, you're the least animated. Yeah, it's political true. country. We're we are, we're it's run weird. we're run by technocrats. We are basically what Britain are. We were run, we're what Britain was in the nineties when when everyone was a technocrat, when no one really, everyone was kind of like a suited, basically civil servant that would tend to be elected, you know. I think that's where we are at the moment. It wasn't always the case. People like Charles Hawhey, who was a James Bond villain. Uh, back in the 1980s um, he was Republican and, and and he was a corrupt fucker but he was a Republican certainly people like Jack Lynch certainly Sean Lamass literally was a member of the IRA he shot uh, MI5 agents in the, <laughs> and he, he definitely believed in stuff but Irish politicians certainly since the 90s um, have been technocratic and are just administrators they don't really have any principles they don't believe in anything and 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 in Britain, for whatever, you know, all the bad things you can say about Britain, there is two, or was, until the last election, maybe still now, a political party that represents capital. That's the Tory party. There's a political party that it certainly is a socialist party at the moment, whether it remains one in the future is anyone's guess, uh, which is the Labour Party. It may have many people in it that aren't socialists and many yeah. people who, are, who believe other things, but we don't have that here. Um, and it's a great tragedy we don't it, it, it's because things have been going by Irish standards well for 30 years um, I mean it should be said that Ireland in the early 1980s had less women in the workforce than Afghanistan has now uh, we had uh, a brain drain in which anyone who had an education was getting the fuck out of this country in the 1980s yeah. uh, so again there That's is nice, there is things to bring in there but again they aren't um, excuses in the here and now uh, we are living in the here and now. Even if you remove multinationals from Irish economy, we are still doing fairly well per head of population by European standards. What are e- multinationals even doing for you? They're just circulating wealth out of the country. Yeah, I mean, and, and pissing off other people in the process. But even if you look at the per head of population uh, GDP, if you remove the multinationals, we're still very good by European standards. Yeah, eighty-five like percent of people in Ireland still work in small and medium-sized Irish-owned companies. You've got a fairly well-educated population. Yeah. Um, you've got a fairly young population yep. um, that can work and are able to work yep. and by and large do work. And most of the ones I bump into are mostly politically aware. There's a cultural dislike of talking about politics yeah, uh, so from certain what people. Me. Well, um, it depends on who you talk to. I mean, most of my friends are very political, but I think there's a kind of a, a polite thing, which is you don't talk about politics, you don't talk about religion. Right. I think they're, which is a kind of America thing, really. Um, but it's a con- you know it's a lingering thing from cons- the conservative era when you didn't talk about politics because your dad or your granddad probably killed you know your oh, friend's your granddad guys. in the Civil War or indeed in the Irish War of Independence or God knows one of these other things and so maybe there was an element of that um, or just in general you didn't talk about politics because when the Brits here they would shoot you if you talked about politics yeah. so I mean there is and again. Those things are matched with a cons- with a kind of conservative Catholic culture, where you know you shouldn't have any opinion that the priest didn't okay, so you better not express your opinion in case the priest he gets back to the priest. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, it seems like similar, like historically to France, where you've got like a Catholic country and mm. um, where the church had a lot of power, like not state power, right enough, mm. or like power anyway. Um, You've got like a history of revolutions. You've got yep. a history of fighting the English. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got all these things, 
and in France they will go to strike because it's a Tuesday mm-hmm. and my god they don't like a Tuesday um, and like, yeah Tuesday. Tuesday shit um, so they'll go to strike for that and in Ireland like you guys don't have affordable housing you don't have half decent broadband mm. you don't have basic public services yep your health system is kind of crap it's not kind of crap it's, it's, it's actually crap well, it's, <laughs> it's actually crap it's truly abysmal it, it's shit right and it's really bad no one really does anything um, no uh, I, I think the people who it affects have become so inured to it um, or don't expect anything to be any better people who can afford private uh, health insurance don't care about people who are stuck in the public system um, I think people who are very wealthy and just go to America or go to go to go somewhere in Europe for healthcare and go fuck everybody else I mean I think uh, the thing that um, James who's who's not here today always talks about is that Ireland has a class system it's not the same as as, uh, as Britain we, we um, removed the aristocracy in, in the late 19th century early 20th century through the land acts but we replaced them originally with a kind of a theocratic uh, aristocracy was the church yeah eventually they lost power uh, but we replaced them again with a capitalist class and so we do have a very tiered hierarchical it's a little less obvious uh, our media is not controlled by Murdoch so it's not as toxic uh, as it is in Britain or in America but it's still there we still have a class system uh, one of our own creation it's not the Brits didn't put it in into us we we you know uh, I've often said if, if the Brits were never here our aristocracy would still be here they'd be speaking Gaelic but they'd be fucking pricks as well yeah um, just because they all had to flee did not mean they were good people it just meant that they were speaking the same language as us and that's a pity that they they uh, that it happened but you know, they would if they were here now. They we would be we would uh, there be our class enemy. You know, and the class enemy is 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 a professional class people who are the civil service and the political culture, a kind of upper middle class kind of business class basically who are property speculators. Even whatever. in France, those people are striking at the moment. The yeah, kind of opera dancers yeah. are like currently on strike. Yeah, well, the thing is, the statistics are pretty bad for Ireland. Again, maybe this explains why the difference is here. It's not an excuse, but it might explain the difference. Which is that unlike in France, we had mass migration out of this country. In Ireland's population was in 1845 about 8.8 million. By 1855, it was 5.7 million. Um, by 1900, it was 4 million. And by the 1930s, it was below 3 million. So you have maybe about 6 to 7 million people leaving this country, most of them poor laborers. Um, or dying through famine or dying through famine yeah. which is otherwise known as uh, mass slaughter on behalf of capital uh, yeah. British capital but the point is we went from a society where 70% of our population were workers were labourers were working class by modern terms uh, to where there's probably one farmer to every labourer in the 1920s which means and a majority of the land uh, 70 odd percent uh, sorry, by the 1920s, it would have been 90 plus percent was owned by farmers. Mm. So you have a situation where about half of it was lived upon by workers, laborers in the 1840s. And no one owned the land other than the British landlords, the Anglo Irish. To the 1920s, when they, pff, tiny amount of them, really none, owned the land, and most of the laborers had already been driven out of the country, and the ones who hadn't fled, maybe only about 200,000 of them. Uh, were still in the country. There was way more farmers and laborers than there were uh, farmers and and uh, big farmers, small farmers, than there were laborers. So we, uh, in the words of one Irish historian, we eradicated our working class. We drove them out of the country. Um, and it's not surprising that such a society would be deeply uh, concerned with private property, deeply concerned with the rights of property holders, uh, and that we. And now again, things have changed. Population has changed in the, in the here and now. We have immigration. We have people who are working in the precariat. It is not what it was a hundred years ago, but it would explain why there is a history there of not really caring about the state being involved, yeah. other than to stay out of your business, because that's kind of what property wants. They want no taxes, which is actually you know uh, free <laughs> free money for them, um, and they certainly have a, a particular hatred of the poor. 
uh, which is can only be the way, you know, through, you know, we can go into this on another podcast, maybe about why it is they hate the poor quite so much uh, and how effective they were at eradicating them. But in France, it's a different culture. Um, and the history of class struggle there is, is much, much longer. It's much more successful. Yeah, um, they quality less. Yeah, and they didn't lose their working class to mass migration and to slaughter in in the charnel house that was the the famine. So I mean, it, there's all that stuff is there. Again, it's not an excuse. It, it's a reason uh, why it is that way. Um, it doesn't mean it has to stay that way. It you know the the fact is that there's a lot more people who would who are now stuck in uh, precarious employment, precarious non-existent housing. You know, paying I don't know two grand for a nine foot by six foot room or whatever that is in meters um which was actually how small one uh, single room tenements were during the the slum era in dublin was nine foot by by uh 12 foot Sorry. you see those old pictures of like someone's put like a well what i would call the washing line down the center yeah. of a room and like a bunch of irish people slumped over it because they rented a small space in the washing lane to sleep really uh, fucking hell like absolutely hideous I mean, that was, again, that's uh, what you will get if you don't stand up and do stuff. I mean, well, this it, did happen. Wasn't there, like, a landlord in Dublin that had housed a bunch of Brazilian migrants illegally? Really? And he'd uh, rented, essentially, a space on the floor to them. And then yes, one day he yes. just came around and said, you'll need to fuck off. You've got about an hour. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. It was, it was absolutely There's a long serious. history of that in when Ireland. I first moved over here, I read about this. I could not believe it. Yeah, it's it's what you get if you don't stand up to capital. If you don't stand up to each of them like three hundred euros. But the thing is, what the thing to bring it back to France is that you um, how this develops, we don't know. Um, we uh, there's some evidence to suggest this is coming off the back of the success of the Yellow Jacket movement, which is interesting in parts. I mean, it, it, Yellow Jacket because it is so um, non hierarchical in certain ways, and certainly diffuse. Um, it has had some interesting developments in certain parts outside of Paris. There's been you know, vaguely anarchist, certainly communalistic um, movement, you know, of local assemblies formed, which is great. I mean, from a perspective of, uh, of wanting that, it's great. Um, and certainly it's, uh, you see these types of things develop when um, class conflict is heating up. Um, doesn't automatically equal class consciousness, doesn't automatically mean that people start, you know, wanting change, but it's certainly a good sign. Um, and you kind of have to be a bit of a historian about this because if you get too, your nose too wedded to what's happening in any election, you're gonna you're gonna get very disappointed. Yeah. Uh, um, you kind of have to take the long view, otherwise you're gonna get very very disappointed very quickly. And you know, it could be Turn the to work and share with your colleagues. Well, it could be the case that Macron has poisoned the well for himself, much like uh, Hollande had before him, and that you could have a Le Pen government next time. That's possible. It's he's very unpopular now. Well, Macron managed to like pin a lot of the blame on the prime minister there, who like yeah, like, but quote, he, unquote, concession. He's still got a was it, another. When did he get elected? Was it two thousand fifteen or two thousand sixteen? Yeah, I want to see fifteen. So he's got another two years. No, it seems like it'd be more than that. I would think it was like two thousand sixteen. It was two thousand seventeen, maybe. Anyway, no, it wasn't. Early, was it? I don't know. Well, we should probably look that up. Yeah, but but he, let's imagine that most he's got another three years or four years uh, oh, yeah. before he has to be reelected. That's more than enough time to be any even more unpopular. And it should be rem- it should be remembered that Hollande was considered the the great white hope. And the strikes when, are really popular. Yeah, right? yeah. So like they aren't they enjoying something like sixty seven seventy five yeah, percent of very popular public opinion. Well, at least originally it was. Yeah, yeah like it's re- like really on their side at the moment. I think the last opinion poll I saw was this morning. Mm. And it said somewhere between 67 and 75, depending mm. on who you were. Yeah. And it, really it should be said that France, French society isn't great if you're Muslim or you're from North African ancestry. Uh, there was a study done a while ago. They put CDs out, resumes. Um, and if you had a, a Muslim name, if you had Mohammed or whatever as your surname, what? <laughs> that's that's a, a reasonable yeah, yeah, expectation yeah. Like, of the racism. Yeah, that you were you were less likely to get a, a, an interview. Like I think by significantly less yeah, likely. Yes. Yeah. Um, and if you ever go to the Bonwe or the kind of the, sl- the pseudo slums areas outside of Paris and outside of most of the big cities, they tend to be North African descent there. And we're talking about fourth or fifth generation people who are French. Oh yeah. Who who just so happen? I mean, it'd be like uh, going out sort of Glasgow and finding tons of people with Irish surnames, and being like, wait a second, what's going on here? Like when did your family leave the famine why are you out here you yeah. know it would be that bizarre and because uh, you know algeria you know was part of france since i think the early 1800s and until the early 1960s i mean generations moved over there over the years that's but there's this vitro- visceral hatred you know it's 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 not a perfect society by any stretch of imagination uh, it has many many problems uh, and those are for french 
you know, comrades to, to figure out themselves. Um, but um, it's certainly the case that, uh, you know, for, th I don't know, 30 or 40 odd years, um, certainly in Britain, <laughs> where it's, I think the game is pretty much up on in Britain, but, but other parts of Europe is fighting against the gradual kind of neoliberal wave of, of privatizing uh, as many public services as possible. Yeah. And it, at this point, we are in a position of people... Uh, who are much more radical than I believe that we should let that happen and to treat and to try and remove any type of state and, and to kind of create communities that uh, fund themselves and kind of have their own local services because there's not a long term uh, victory to be had from having this uh, propping up the state. If you're a left communist, if you're an anarchist, what's the point in uh, fighting against what will, is maybe inevitable? Uh, but uh, rather than being productive and trying to come up with an alternative. Now, that's a view. It's not necessarily my view, but it's a view. Um, what's the good of just fighting this this uh, rearguard action when it comes to the, the state? If the state is subservient to capital and, and increasingly to international capital, is there any long-term uh, achievement? That was a dog in the background. Uh, <laughs> is there any long-term um, purpose to doing this any longer? What do you think about that? I'm not sure. So, like... I'm not a big fan of the state. I think it does like you know, terrible things, and it's like a terrible way of like mediating social relations and all that kind of jam. Um, I suppose like if you live in a community where they have just withdrawn various public services, and your community is in a position to organise that and make sure it goes to the people who need it, then even if in twenty years' time the state and the, or the government of the day decide actually we can fund these public services in that community why would you accept the state's help if you've come up with like what is essentially a parastate solution mm. um, then all we've done is I suppose reconstruct the state but yeah I'm not, I'm not really sure so like mm. would you would you have necessarily a problem with um, if the state withdrew as it is withdraw I mean the problem is that the state is both withdrawing but also maintaining taxes in Britain other I mean the state's it. role at the moment is what to enforce private contracts between individuals yes like that's what it's been used for um, so functionally speaking, it is performing a mass withdrawal of public mm. services. Yeah, um, it does not care. No, it it's doesn't. Not, it's not a structure of care at all. Well, the thing is, the people are so so many people are very illiterate and, as to what exactly it's going on, and so all these things are going on, and elections happen every five years or something like that, and people are so have no. It's like asking somebody. I think I, we joked about this before. It's like me turning up uh, to somebody who's never read the book June. And saying, so, uh, what's your opinion on the Quitsack Haderach? And you kind of go, well, uh, so the spice melange, should, do we need it? Do we not need it? You kind of go, um, your choice is between the Baron Harkonnen, uh, you know, and the Atreides family. Who do you vote for? People are like, eh? So, I mean, if people, it'd be, it'd be like that. So It's just a, a different conceptual space and a different language. Yeah, like absolutely. Entirely. So, like... It's like economics. Economics is just is bizarre as well. Like, like if you don't um, have that uh, uh, lingua franca, if you don't have that vocabulary, it's like, what the fuck is a tranche? Yeah, like, like what the fuck? You know, don't know like um, credit default swap. What the hell's that? That's right. Uh, that's it. Like, there's like there's so people are economically literate, and when people say, you know, we can't afford pensions, we can't afford nineteen billion, because imagine the country is like a household. And your household has just spent all its money on credit cards and you've kind of run out of credit cards now. What do you do? And everyone will say, well, you need to cut back on stuff you spend mm. um, to repay the credit. That's not how a ma that's not how an economy works. No. Like, it's nothing like how an economy works. But it's a narrative of the public can access mm. because they're like, well, I know what it's like to be in debt. I know what yeah. it's like to have a credit card. That must be how that works. So do you think the ECB and the European Union is um, a great hindrance to anyone who would want to make a an argument, not even a socialist argument, but certainly a social democratic argument, for funding things like pensions and funding things like public infrastructure projects, you said that they're not going to okay nineteen billion, and uh, you know, is there an argument for a, a exit from the European Union if it's become a uh, I, <laughs> if it's purely there to reinforce neoliberal doctrine? Uh, yeah, so like there was um, that discussion in the UK about Lexit, as it was called, um, like the left exit. Um, if the if the British narrative on Brexit was should we leave the European Union because its primary its primary concern 
is to make sure that capital keeps on circulating around countries so that they all remain fluid and buoyant. That's an interesting conversation to mm. have. I'm not sure how it would have come down on that side of the, on the debate. Um, but obviously in the UK, the, the narrative was, how do we get rid of as many migrants as possible? Mm. Um, we need to get rid of people from Afghanistan and Pakistan yeah. and Syria. Um, those famous European countries. Yeah. Um, and you've got Nigel Farage standing in front of like a conveyor mm. belt of brown people. Yeah. Um, you know, like uh, the whole thing was ridiculous. On those grounds, you vote mm. to remain. Because but that's, that's what not the, the argument. But that's what, what the pen is saying. The pen is coming at it from a we need to leave the European Union because, and she said this about the pensions. Yeah, she did. Yeah. Um, the pen. So she's defending the state's involvement when it comes to pensions. The Volk. Um, and Mélenchon, I think is the other guy, who's more of a kind of socialist candidate, left yeah, of, that's uh, right, yeah. further left. He says basically the same thing. The European Union is, is, a, is a neoliberal uh, I mean, I mean, club of sense. gangsters. You know, yeah, it, no, it is. No, we don't argue that it isn't. Um, the problem in Ireland is that because, you know, <laughs> effectively, you know, Ireland became independent. Uh, it kind of just removed the Brits and put the church in charge. The church eventually lost authority. It probably as much because of people people had money in their pockets as anything. And that's capital, and that's you know, and that's the the European Union. And so they are as sacred a cow as as cows in India. I suppose you can't really touch them and say anything against them. Yeah. And certainly not when you have a situation where the age old enemy, the perf perfidious Albion is now the enemy of the European Union, or at least in newspapers it is. I mean, the European Union did a lot of good in Ireland, right? Like, yeah. There was a lot of corruption in Ireland, and the European yeah. Union helped. Infrastructure well projects were very important in terms of building roads, in terms of... We have much smaller population, so small amounts of money Stuffing can make it, big yeah. differences yeah, as to absolutely. that. The fact that we were part of a European uh, trading... Uh, uh, free trade uh, uh, kind of block is a huge thing. Through the European Union, we've been able to trade with countries around the world. Japan obviously has a free trade agreement with them. Your currency is more stable as well like all you these know, kind of things yeah absolutely and what well, we were finally able to to disengage ourselves from sterling we were still using sterling until 1976 okay uh, but really economically speaking we were a hinterland to the british economy until the mid 70s mm. uh 75 percent of what we exported went to britain until the early mid 70s so i mean it was the european union allowed us basically to become an independent country. Yeah. Today we trade more with Belgium than we do with Britain. So I mean, these are things which have been good, to a certain extent. Um, and again, how you uh, deal with that? Again, we don't have to be um, the way we are. Um, France has a better attitude towards these things. Again, these are type of these are debates. I don't know if you could call them Keynesian debates. Would it be Keynesianism to kind of suggest these types of things? Uh, yeah, I mean, like Keynesianism would just say the thing to do during a time of like economic mm. uh, depression um, spend. is just spend a lot of money on infrastructure projects, yeah. increase the infrastructure, you can increase the... But aren't interest rates really low now? So in theory, if you wanted yeah. to borrow money to pay for the pensions that come up with much. a... Yeah, because it would be zero, really, isn't it? Sure, I, I mean, yeah, like if, if the interest rate is zero, then it will cost you nothing to like, yeah. well, it will cost you the money you, you borrow. Yeah, but, but like, that's... But you pay that back over X amount of years. Yeah. And again, very rarely do people ever really wholly pay it back, do they? Like certain certain projects, you kind of, it goes on for I'd imagine decades. France would pay it back because, like, you know, they're a big, wealthy state. Um, so there you go. So if they can't, like, so, again, 19 billion isn't that much. No. It just uh, sounds like an enormous For a population of 66 million people, yeah. um, many of them were living fairly well and, and spending a fair amount on these. If things. the pensions crisis was... Uh, medieval church that had gone up in flames yeah yeah um exactly yeah. The money yeah so i mean it's not it's not actually about reform it's about the it's, a choice. it's about the capitalist class of the property class deciding do you know what um ideologically i think this is a good idea it's not necessarily a good idea for society probably not a good idea for the economy if people can't really survive or not able to work or you know have a survivable pension they're not going to be spending any money yeah. it's like uh, uh, capitalism 101 you have money you spend it that's good this is like the accumulation problem Luxembourg yeah. talks about, right? Like, eventually over time, you've got this capitalist class with all the money, and then yeah. the proletariat you need to spend money, eventually yeah. have no money. Yeah. Um. So like this obviously causes an internal crisis. The yeah. whole thing collapses. And the traditional way of of sorting this out was imperialism. Yeah. But now, everywhere's been colonized. Yeah. <laughs> so like, what do you do? It's and true. Well, Africa what is. What you do is you try and get 
private pensions for people instead. Wasn't of Africa that was considered to be, even the even the sorry, Japanese even the Chinese are putting enormous amount of money into moving their kind of some of their infrastructure not infrastructure um, factories etc. To, to Africa. To yeah. Africa yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's the next big market to open up. Isn't it? That's it. Like in the African market is it's kind of growing and it is opening up. Uh, the French are definitely involved in that. <laughs> well, yeah, like the you know the, the history of like France and Africa is absolutely mm. appalling. Um, Never met an African country they didn't want to invade or bomb. Uh, oh yeah, the French. Even recently, Mali. Sure, they were only in there a couple of years mm. ago. There you go. And they were um, they were the ones who armed the Hutu militias and the Rwandan genocide. Great. And also protected them as they were fleeing into the Congo. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's the They're the ones who toppled Gaddafi. Most of the people were involved in the French army and the and the um, air force. I mean, again, France is not some. Uh, it's very. It's actually a weird mirror image of Britain in a weird way. There's certain they, uh, very similar things about them. One of like the favorite things to see in Britain is that the French are a bunch of cowards that can't win a war or whatever. That's not historically, well, not like, true. <laughs> they are like I think they won World War Two. They've won. War the War French have won more military battles than any other yeah. country ever. Beat the British. Beat the English. Pardon me. In the Hundred Years' War. Uh, they beat them in. I mean, Napoleon was a prolific battle winner, right? Yeah, no, he won consistently. He was one of the greatest generals in world history. Um, and beat certainly he had. If he, he only ever went up against the British army himself once in Waterloo, and by then, you know, and very nearly beat um, uh, Wellington. Uh, if it hadn't been for Blucher, who was a German Prussian general, who came in. I'm saying stuff that's not interesting. Anyway, the point is that um, it's uh, how. I mean, this is probably part of a broader. You know, assault on um, the welfare state's been going on for a long time. If the left uh, only weds itself to defending liberal parties that are pretty ambiguous about whether they want pensions to continue on, I think we're just going to have more of the same, which is more and more defeats as just the momentum is now on the side and has been for a while. We have to come up with a better way to respond to it. Um, I Certainly, anarchism has the advantage of no of not wanting the state to exist as it as it currently does. There would be any need for a pension in an anarchist state, right? Uh, well, you're never going to have a you're, you're never going to have that be uh, easy, or you're never going to have it being um, um, unchallenged. The point is, uh, in the situations when they have existed, they've been attacked from every side. The Spanish, yeah, Spanish Revolution is attacked by everybody. Uh, from fascists to, to Stalinists to liberal uh, de Democrats. They all attacked it because it was the ultimate threat uh, that people would run their own affairs yeah. and run their own communities. Show people how it's done. That was the best argument for Scottish independence I'd heard. Which was um, if Scotland goes independent, then we can show the world how you could have a progressive yeah. left-wing government. Um, which, you know, isn't going to happen. <laughs> but, like, we could in principle. It's more likely. It's statistically, more likely, statistically more likely not by UK. much, but it's more. Um, but, yeah, we tend to vote for, like, centre-left governments. Um, yeah. And there's not, like, there's nothing to say, well, if Scotland did go independent, we'd be able to vote in quite a hard left-wing government. Mm. Um, it's certainly not going to happen as part of the UK. No. It's more likely to happen. Well, I mean, in the end, the European Union... Uh, the thing with the French, th the French um, strikes is... If this leads to a situation where you have a major crisis with the European Union, which uh, where whether it survives or not, another economic collapse, which statistically which is going to happen at some point, uh, and depending on how much debt we have at the moment, which seems to be an enormous amount of debt, um, worldwide debt rather than and most of it's household debt, isn't it? Uh, yeah, private debt is pretty enormous. But yeah. like, so is like state debt as well. Which is but state debt isn't it much easier? Isn't it much easier to deal with state debt than? It is if debt? you have a central bank. Yeah, yeah. not uh, if you have central bank being in, in the Hague or wherever. If you've got yeah. like a debt in a foreign currency, then you've got a big problem. If you've mm. got a debt in your own currency, then you can just pay it off yourself. But that'll increase yeah. inflation. Yeah. Um, which some people think is okay, other people think it's not. Um, but there's ways of offsetting problems of inflation. Like mm. one one obvious way to like offset the problem of printing money is to give everyone a what's it called the universal basic income yeah um there's arguments i don't see i don't see people right. doing that <laughs> um but weirdly apparently nixon was for a ubi he well no what happened was that that plan was begun under lbj right okay um he was again not opposed to it but when you had well, when the was that? that was what the 60s late 70s? 60s 67 yeah. or 68 he, because lbj had the um the war on poverty he wanted to basically eradicate unemployment and remove any type of poverty especially amongst his constituents which mm. was the white working class um who he'd mu very much alienated with the uh, the bringing in of civil rights yeah, and the, the again he he was uh, not a great person in many ways 
But he did. He was a social democrat by certainly by American standards. He was. Yeah. He's a veritable radical by American standards. Uh, but even Nixon thought he would have done it if it hadn't been for the oil crisis in the early seventies. Yeah. And then when they moved off um, the, I think was seventy one or seventy two, they, they, uh, uh, what's the, but the dollar used to represent a certain amount of gold. It wasn't the gold standard, but there was an agreement, uh, oh, with, uh, Bretton, Woods Bretton Woods agreement. agreement yeah. yeah, that was done away with in seventy one or yeah. seventy two, and they went to the petrodollar. Was it? Uh, yeah, the, I think so. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the point is, um, these. This is. What's going on in France is, as we've already said, it'd probably be part of a longer process. How the left deals with that is still evolving. And on that rather depressing note, <laughs> that's our... We need, no, we need to have an optimistic note. Okay, and that's... We've already had... Like, on an op- well, no, of course, yeah. On an optimistic note, um, the fact that we're talking Mass about... Maastrichts? Maastrichts are yeah, great. Yeah, that's the optimistic that's, Absolutely. The French streets are ringing in the sounds of organised labour. What's, what's bad about that? Long may it continue. <laughs> So next we're going to talk about um, the lovely topic of the Great British Monarchy. Um, Massive controversy last week where Meghan Markle, who is Prince Harry's wife... The um, Duchess of Sussex? The Duchess of Sussex, no less, um, has been blamed roundly by the British media for taking Harry away from his gran... Uh, i.e. the Queen. Otherwise known, she took the wains against us. She took, <laughs> took the wains against us. <laughs> She's turned the wains against <laughs> she us. She turned the wains against us. Sorry, the yeah, yeah. Against Sorry, us. Yeah. Um, Prince Harry announced to the great British public that he wanted to take less of a role in the public life of the monarchy and that he indeed wanted to move to Canada um, to be presumably with his wife. Um, the Queen responded by saying that she was, quote, disappointed and then a couple of hours later hurt in big inverted commas uh, on the BBC News. Um, this was met with a massive public backlash, like enormous public backlash in the UK. Against? Against Meghan Markle because, you know, she's like not a white woman. And I was about to say, she's yeah. Taken <laughs> away, she's taken away the Queen's grandson. Um, the next day in the Daily Mail, they had uh, Kate Middleton, or Kate Windsor now, I suppose, um, who the fuck knows and who the fuck cares who cares like what are they the Duchess of Cambridge is that her title I think he's the Duke of Cumberland I fuck knows yeah, I, it's I, one of these, things, right? these are things that Irish people don't have to know anymore nah, it's ridiculous <laughs> like I try and not know but you can't help it if you live in yeah. the UK so um, what did they say did they say something uh, well no they were just like glorious pictures of them like looking like oh look at these guys they're like ideal British monarchs not like these degenerate British monarchs moving to Canada mm. taking away our beloved Prince Harry who dresses like a Nazi uh, formerly, for, uh, sorry, formerly. <laughs> and allegedly <laughs> and allegedly we don't know that he stopped for we purposes of stopped. legal advice allegedly yeah. Do and, we have and for, no um, we have the but we day. might <laughs> yeah we probably need one uh, uh, that's fine. I will say a lot of things that may get us into trouble. That's fine. That's, uh, we live and work and on a society. tugboat just off the coast of the sixth circle of hell. Fifth circle, Fifth, pardon me. Yeah, good. We just we went up a level. Um, yeah. So I mean, I, th- I think the there's two ways to talk about this, which is one, how ridiculous it is, which is seems self evident once that you actually cross. Uh, the UK border in from tan land into <laughs> sanity land um, but uh, you know when we can talk about that we could also talk about uh, why is it that the British media uh, which to be honest with you is a toxic dump of everything that is wrong with the world it a um, it's a horrendous cesspit but why in particular they have decided to target her uh, we can talk about mm. both those things. Uh, maybe we should talk about the latter. There seems to be a lot more meat uh, as to why Brit, you know, why Britain's so fucking insane. That's it could be here all day. So maybe we, why do you think, Will, that uh, this um, toxic uh, newspaper culture has targeted Meghan Markle? It may be the fact that she's not like you know Aryan. Um, it may be the fact that she's from North America and an actor which is like I think the royal family still consider that to be beneath their dignity Mm. Um, she's not obviously from like the landed aristocracy nope Um, they had a hard enough time accepting Kate Middleton who was not from the landed aristocracy she was just she was just wealthier just incredibly wealthy Yeah, she was actually wealthier than landed aristocracy (laughs) yeah that's right I think her dad was a pilot or something right like pirate pilot oh pilot <laughs> <laughs> pirate of sorts uh, yeah definitely so um 
Yeah, apparently the Queen was very rude to her mother all the time. Oh, no. But then she seemed amazing in comparison compared to Meghan Markle. Well, you know, she's found a way to, to fit in by being a brood mare for uh, the monarchy, which is basically as long as you're popping out kids. Oh, and yeah. they're all boys so far, Future I think. Are they, aren't they all boys? They are all boys. There you go. She's They've all got certain names like George and like, you know, your classic And William. <laughs> well, well, that's not often name, William. Yeah. Um, Get out. <laughs> yeah. So like, unfortunately for me, my fiance's name is Elizabeth. Um, so like we're going to be if we when we get married, oops, um, Will and Liz. we're going to be Will and Liz, which is uh, pretty shameful. Which is a nineteen seventy, it's like a nineteen seventies BBC show. Awful. We're Will and Liz in suburbia. There They've is, got a kooky neighbor oh. who believes in in organic farming. That was actually a thing. Well, there was a TV show in the seventies. Was it? It's like oh god. Oh, is it the Good Life or something? The Good Life. The good yeah, Life. Yeah. Okay. So um, interestingly, anyway. I don't know if you saw this. There was a Twitter poll that like the day Harry announced that he was like naffing off to Canada mm. and it said which it was um one of these like Daily Telegraph Twitter poll things. I mm. don't know if it was a telegraph, but it was some sort of like pro monarchy right wing newspaper. Yeah. And the question was which is more important, British tradition and, you know, standing in accordance with your historical norms. Or I, I doubt it was that that, that well worded. I think, I think it was genuinely worded yeah. like something. Oh, like, you're British! Oh, oh you're British! <laughs> Lead. Um, or individual liberty. And fifty-two percent said what matters more is respecting traditional norms. There was another poll which asked, "Should we change back to um, pre-decimalisation?" Oh no! Um, and it won by sixty-nine percent. It's just embarrassing. The whole thing is just... I want blue passports! I want to... I want two shillings and guineas! It's it's like the... Look at the stain I'm now getting when I go through Dublin Airport and show my passport. Um, Ah, well, you'll have a new passport soon enough. Come on, come on. You'll have a new passport soon enough. (laughs) One way or the other, you'll have a new (laughs) passport. Scottish independence kicks off. Oh, well, you know, just Irish people might just take pity on you and go, you're red hair, that's fine. You're basically Irish. Yeah. The Scots used to live over here. They were called Scott Eye. Yeah. For people who didn't know. That's fine. Um, I should say that Canada is hardly the bastion of, of racial... Um, equality, having lived there for yeah. a columnar, uh, lived there for seven years in total. Okay. Now most of that when I was a kid, but two years when I was an adult working there, and I came across more people who were racist towards people. Gonna really you're racist towards them um, than ever. And my God, there's such unbelievable hostility towards Muslims there. Oh, I really? think I don't think people really understand what it's actually like in Canada until you live there. It can't I, be worse than the English, surely. No, they can't be worse than the English. But that's <laughs> because. We all agree. But here's the thing: the, the benefits of having the second largest country in the world is you, there's a bit more space to play around right, with. You okay. know, there's only something like twenty-five or twenty-six million or whatever it is, small amount anyway, given how big the country is, to play around with. But over ninety percent of them live within a hundred miles of the actual American border. So. Okay. There is not a huge amount of people living in... in. Anyway, the, the point is, um, I don't think they really realise what Canada's like. That said, they'll live in their gated community of, of Justin yeah. Trudeau voters who probably will be fairly nice to them. And like, oh, thank you. But, you know, it, it's, it seems to me that the thing to talk about here... Uh, I mean, there's so many ridiculous things to talk about. With, but the thing to talk about is, why is it that Levinson, Levinson 2... Levinson 2? which was a report that came out uh, roundly criticising not only the tabloids, but just the broad toxic culture within British media was not uh, listened to. The uh, view would have been that there should have been an Ofcom, basically some degree of control over what is put out there. If it is blatant and utter lies, lies, then as as it is the case with the BBC, at least in in theory, though obviously not in practice when it comes to Andrew Neil or fucking Marr or any of these, or Louise Knussberg? Uh, uh, Laura Kunzberg. Laura Laura Kunzberg. Uh, again, those people aside, if you are blatantly lying, apparently, you're not, you will be called out by Ofcom. There's nothing to exist in terms of that. The media, and in terms of like the Sun, obviously the Daily Mail, everyone knows about the Daily Mail, Telegraph, I mean, there are an astounding amount of lies and just just really I just you scratch your head and go how on earth does this even get 
publish. I mean, there must be some type of law against like the yeah, fear over of libel alone should should the make amount it. of like rancor she's received in response. Like she's perceived as being the person that's animated this move or the person that's motivated this move to Canada. Where like I don't know what they're basing that on, but they're blaming <laughs> her for Harry wanting to like you know not live in a castle in Windsor anymore or whatever. Mm. Um, but the amount of rancor that she's had directed at her for that versus the amount of rancor that was fired off at Prince Andrew mm. when it became pretty clear that he wait we, we can't say that he abused a child yeah you can okay but like we're in this ter- fifth circle of hell right now <laughs> there are no laws here there's no laws in um, fifth circle of hell okay, that's why we're trying so, to re- watch as uh, Prince Andrew resuscitates uh, fucking Jeffrey Epstein there there was no um, there was like very little rancor leveled at Prince Andrew when it was quote alleged um, that he was a child abuser that was friends with um, Jeffrey Epstein. Should be said he is a child abuser. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, the photos, like, there's, like, so much evidence suggesting this. And yeah. That interview he did on the BBC was terrible. Mm. Um, and it certainly, certainly did, like, it lended no credibility to his story yeah. at all. He doesn't spec that, that, as a war hero. That whole that, stuff is ridiculous. <laughs> the pizza place in Woking. Oh, yeah. been the same. <laughs> It's where all the royals hang out. It's but I mean, but it's, it's 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 just comical. I mean, it's at a certain point when it comes to British society, it's just it's you can't. There's nothing you can do but laugh. I mean, there's a, it's it's so. I dis- don't know. You can cry as well. I don't live there, so I don't have to cry. No, no, I do. Um, <laughs> it's but it's it, it's it's very it's very hard to be surprised by it anymore. It's just it's gone so. I don't like to use the word insane because there's people who actually have mental problems, but it has gone just it is. We were talking about this before the um, we started uh, recording the podcast, but it was probably, it's probably both of our contention that there's something very odd about British culture which happens with a society that never really deals with its past or never really changes. So it's still a monarchy, still has an aristocracy. It has also, of course, a, a tremendously wealthy and powerful uh, capitalist cla- class, which has been added on to it. And even that was hard to achieve in the 19th century, but it was added onto it. But otherwise, you know, it's a nation of subjects, not a nation of citizens. There's yeah. there's no real interest in large swathes of the population who obviously have the right to vote, to actually vote or to take part in anything. It's very easy, seemingly, for um, the media, which is obviously owned primarily by a mixture of those t- t- different classes, to convince people uh, to vote very powerfully against their interests. I mean, it's it's. I mean, I mean, not to not to say Corbyn was perfect, but to see the just hatchet job against him, um, most of it just other bullshit, um, and how effective it was. It was. It's it's going to be very difficult for anyone on the left or anyone just who's just sensible who who, who want to tackle that. Because imagine, I mean, it goes back from the Scottish independence referendum to the alternative. <clears throat> The alternative vote. Do you remember the alternative yeah, vote referendum? I remember that. And you kind of go, you can't get anything done. Nothing. There's a there's an iron grip on on the status quo, and it's the media, primarily. Obviously, again, we, we know who owns the media, but it, it, it's and it's enabled by the fact that I think there's in Britain there's this perception, which is maybe grounded in the in the monarchy and aristocracy, which is that we really don't, you know, want to have that. We don't really want to be involved in this. Like now and again. You know, it's nice to know that you, our opinion is, is in, you know, Brexit is an, opinion, an expression of an opinion. But otherwise, you go ahead and do that. Well, I don't really want anything to do with it, which is a view of a kind of, of a subject, of, of, a, of, a, of a surf. Yeah, I mean, like Clive Lewis, I think, uh, who was standing to be Labour leader, and I don't know if his, like, I don't know if he's received enough votes or whatever, but he said that there should be a referendum on whether or not we have a monarchy. Mm. And if he became Prime Minister under a Labour government, um, of a Labour government, sorry. Um, he would have that referendum and lo and behold the next day just like the mere suggestion that this might happen yeah. um, he became unelectable yeah. that was it it's they, would, they would rather have a monarchy of paedophiles than not have a monarchy yeah. that's horrifying and that's the point I mean you have a situation where as we said um, Prince Andrew who <laughs> in a diving bell as we speak is I mean by any standard um, you know a sex pest at best at worst, uh, a guilty of uh, of pedophilia on some level. Um, not a, you know, basically given uh, not only you know, I, if he was given a fair shake, there maybe you might have had a couple of you know pro and anti monarchy pundits on I don't know Good Morning Britain or whatever. But you don't even have that. It's it's um, 
is this odd? Is there anything odd about this? No, I don't think there's anything odd. Yeah, it's something a bit odd. What are you saying about the monkey? Just a few bad apples, right? Like just a few bad. Anyway, a few on to another. But this this fucking Meghan Markle thing never ending. Um, and let's break it down for a second. Why? Because again, race is obviously a component. But I I wonder whether there's something else about it. Uh, she being an outsider. There's kind of an element of she's an outsider. She's divorced. She's yeah. an actress. She has her own money. Wasn't there she, some other like British monarch that like Wallace abdicated Simpson. his seat? Yeah, exactly. Wallace Simpson. Was Mar- she was divorced. Yeah, and also American. Uh, and American, 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 yeah. And there was a huge fucking hissy fit, and he had yeah. to uh, he had to step down. Um, no, I mean, I, I think there's a there's it, there is that thing which is has been said by people, which is the majority of the serf population of the of the peasants of the of the plebs are perfectly fine with the monarch as long as they look depressed. There is this thing which is that monarchy is meant to be a, a tremendous weight. Oh, the duty. The, 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 no, the, duty. And the duty is meant to make you sad and depressed. And if you look like you're having a good time, and if you look like you're sure, doing your own thing... They've got loads of power and they've got loads of establishments and castles, but man, yeah. it must be tough being the monarchy. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I the thing that's there. bizarre is that the people used to accuse Irish people of, you know, put your head above the parapet, you get it shot off. And there is an element to that to Irish society. It's way worse than fucking if you, in Britain if you go against the established quote. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Quote. Like, it's, it's, it's shocking. Like, it's really bad. She was considered quite outspoken um, because, you know, she had views and she was a woman... Yeah. Unbelievable. Like, can you imagine 2020 having views as a woman? Yeah. Um, and yeah, like, the amount of, like, memes in the UK that are, like, of, like, Yoko Ono saying, I broke up the Beatles, mm. uh, out to that, and then Meghan Markle saying, hold my beer, like, those sort of things. Um, it's but there, just bizarre. There was a video of a bootlicker, a guy called uh, John Larry, I think his name was, fucking Irish surname, of course. <laughs> um, but he's probably he's not Irish he's English and he was standing in front of Buckingham Palace oh, decked like head really quick like yeah. distancing oh he's not Irish is he? <laughs> no 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 well, he's certainly not um, he's probably he's probably one of the famine Irish who went over and became so starved he filled his belly full of monarchy um, but anyway he and he was indeed and he was standing in front of Buckingham Palace and he was decked head to toe in British flags oh and I he, think I sent that to the group you did yeah. we have a WhatsApp uh, <laughs> but on the on his woolly head uh uh, it's Canadians call it a toque, uh, like a, a cap. Was all these little badges of the fucking queen, and it was the most. I mean, it's something people should think about when they are having sex because it's the most repellent mm. thing for men, uh, for more than for women, I would imagine. Or well, who knows? I'm not going to judge. That's not king shame, anyone. No, no, that's not actually absolutely. Depression if you are looking for opinion. for longevity in <laughs> sex, I would advise watching that video and memorizing it. And it is just. I mean, the, uh, and you know, even people like James O'Brien was an LBC who, who I really just hate. He loves the sound of his own voice. Um, he was We're like, doing a podcast. Yeah, no, indeed. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he has his own podcast, um, but he has his own TV show, not TV show, sorry, um, uh, radio, radio show, yeah. which is certainly a evidence of loving your own voice. And he goes on for fucking hours. Anyway, uh, Brexit, Brexit. Uh. Um, but yeah, it's even he was like, this is a fucking bootlicker. I mean, it's unbelievable. But I think that. Maybe is a much larger component of the population than most of us would like it's to. It's part know. of the overall aesthetic. You've got like the, like you know, poppy year-round poppy wearers, um, like you know, the part of this like weird poppy death cult. Um, yeah. That just like walk around all the time with this poppy on to support our boys, not our troops, our boys. Like, mm. That's the slogan. Then all over England, especially in the south, it seems you've got like these cut-out Tommies. Um, from yeah. World War One, like you know, like the kind of plucky working class yeah. soldiers going <laughs> off to do their duty. Then you've got those that same demographic of people really support the monarchy, it's a standard, and they yeah. also watch the Great British Bake Off and all these other like hyper, like um, nationalistic establishment aesthetic yeah. TV shows. Then you've got oh, I got berated by a friend. I say berated um, for calling the Netflix show The Queen, where it's called The Crown. Um, apparently. I, I don't know enough about about the Queen to like know what the TV yeah. shows made in her honour are called, but it's called The Crown. I'm told on Netflix. Do you think but that all was these things? It all contributes to an overall aesthetic. Do you think that's intentional? Is there anyone who who's trying to resuscitate a kind of nineteen, you know, pre World War One, no, pre World War One 
deferential, very much more deferential society where the state really didn't exist, other than, of course, to make sure free trade benefits landowners and businessmen. Yeah. But otherwise, the working class can live in tenements and fucking die at 40 from tuberculosis. Who gives a fuck? That's not the narrative that's presented. The narrative that's presented is the working classes before, like, the 1920s or whatever. Um, sure, they, they had a hard life, but they worked hard and they were respectful and you could leave your door open and your door no, was you actually... Couldn't. <laughs> your door, now, your door was made of paper and everyone knew each other and there was no like child molesters and there was definitely no domestic <laughs> abuse and all these things happened because of the modern era mm. and if we could just go back to those days of Queen Victoria it should be said would be fine. at the same time as the British Empire controlled uh, 25% of the land mass of the world <laughs> yeah. and had the largest fleet and largest economy and also you know, killed millions of people. And in actuality, like the work, the lives of working people was still shit. They were. The, the yeah. difference was some of them went off to places where lives were shit for other people and made their lives worse yeah. by being uh, the colonial police or being the British Army there, Redcoats, you know? It's my favourite Radiohead song is Colonial Police. <laughs> it's yeah. an actual song. No, it's Karma Police. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it's... Uh, I, I, you never know with, uh, <laughs> with Radiohead. It's my, yeah, that's the thing. It's all <laughs> equally depressing. Um, but I mean, the, the but thing... Yeah. I mean, I remember with this book uh, I read when I was... A teenager called um, Scramble for Africa. This guy called Packenham did it, and he was very jovial. He was a nice read or whatever. But he kind of and he wasn't really hammering home the point that like society after society in Africa, if you look at South Africa, from the Germans taking over what is Namibia now, to the Portuguese being Mozambique, to the British Army uh, invading Zululand, um, destroying their society. Uh, to them eventually going even after the Boers, who were white as well, <laughs> yeah. to them going into uh, into what was Namib- uh, Matabela land, it was called, and became uh, Southern Rhodesia, which eventually became Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe yeah. uh, and even beyond that, and society after society destroyed, culture destroyed, pe- uh, you, know, uh, you know, agrarian societies driven into the uh, cheap labor, into the diamond mines and the gold mines. In, in, in its, I mean, this is you know, by any standards, a horrendous crime. But you look at what uh, what Boris Johnson recently said, which was this was the, you know, Britain built itself on uh, as an empire of free trade. I was like, fuck no. no. But your empire is a fucking slave empire, uh, which later on hoisted wage slavery. And yeah, not that free. No, it's fucking insane. Nothing, well, I suppose like slave, slavery is literally free. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in regards to Meghan Markle, I think it's, it's she, you know, has contravened this, intru- this invisible line which says you should be like Kate Middleton, which is shut up, look pretty, uh, pump out children, have no opinions that are not opinions that uh, buttress the status quo, and whatever you do, provide us as many photos of you, of your child, uh, as you can produce, and then we are good, we'll be fine, but also be white too. One of the reasons but be white hasn't too. <laughs> got rid of their monarchy is um, it's media fodder. Yeah. Like the, the papers love the monarchy. Like yeah. they always sell papers. If you put a picture of my, I swear, I swear to God, Princess Diana on the front page of the Daily Mail, that paper is going to sell. And man, they must like put that picture of Diana up, like the people's mm. princess, with that in, like ridiculous slogan. Yeah. Um, I'd say once a year, twice a year. Yeah. And then it's normally around about the same time as a mm. poppy sale or something as well. Now, the thing that to be trying to be pre- uh, pre- proactive or pr- productive I suppose with this conversation would be is how on, how on earth does the left combat that and I don't know I, I, I find it very difficult to uh, find a way to combat that Clement Attlee in the Labour Party in the mid 20th century obviously found a way to embrace the empire uh, embrace monarchy um, with the proviso that a certain amount of housing and healthcare is provided to the working class in repayment for service in the world wars Yeah, um, because of you know things are very very different now in every single way that's it's very hard to see how even that would work i don't know if if ed miliband had become hyper nationalistic a la tony blair if that would actually have worked i think he didn't fit a lot of things not just because in the eyes of the establishment he wasn't properly he wasn't a chap and that could have been because his dad was a jewish refugee and his mother was a jewish refugee He didn't, you know, he was painted as Millhouse, as as a as a foolish, childish, stupid person. What he might his heart might have been the wrong way, in the right way, in some ways. But he was red Ed, and his dad was a traitor. You know. Yeah. yeah I don't know. I don't know if the left can win by doing that direction. No, like I've been reading a lot of like books recently, um, 
like I don't know if you know like the Alex Williams Nick Schrinner checkbook the what's it called Inventing the Future oh, I've heard of it they talk it. about um, the Mon Pelerin Society of the Left mm. like you know like these kind of far right people have got um, a coherent aesthetic a coherent narrative which and they, they own the media mm. um, and they can just like constantly thump out this this narrative that they've that they can manufacture mm. themselves and uh, Nick and Alex both I'm using their first names um, they say that the left need to come up with something similar or you can never combat it mm. um, the person that founded Novara Media I think took this quite seriously and they thought okay I'll start a channel namely Novara Media mm. um, and in the UK you've got other podcasts like Trash Future mm. trying to do no, something yeah. similar but given how like how strong a grip the media class have on British yeah. um attitudes yeah. generally speaking then I think that is the only way we can combat it it's so a generational thing too yeah definitely I mean it's not there are historical precedents to this as there is to everything which is there was a period of time and people like uh, E.P. Thompson um, and many many others have talked about this where media print culture pamphlets newspapers were not policed at all the establishment thought working class people were idiots and therefore they didn't need to police it. And so throughout the 1780s, 1790s, even into the 1820s and 30s, there was very little control on what was printed. And if they did control it, they smashed the the, um, the prints, uh, the, the um, what they called them? The print press, machines, yeah. printing presses. But again, the radical movements would buy more and they'd find a way to, to deal with it. And that was probably one of the, in terms of certainly in British history, one of the periods of greatest radicalism. You had this is around Peterloo, this is the uh, 1790s. It was, there was great fear there would be a revolution in Britain and the, the which would spread from France. You go into the 1820s, there's uh, movements for Catholic emancipation, which finally achieved, thanks to mostly Irish demonstrators, but some in Britain as well. You have the Reform Bill in 1832. There was a real fear of medium. So they passed laws that made it unbelievably expensive to print. And so apart from a few, you know, uh, people who could afford it, and it became more linked to trade unions and to yeah. groups like that. Well, and it took a long well. time. Trade unionism wasn't really properly established until the late night in the 19th century. Their media survives a while. It creates a self, like a, a community within the community. And so maybe what the left will have to do is just take the view that it's going to require that. Now, things like podcasts have certainly aided that. Creating our own media online is already happening anyway. I mean, this has been happening now for 20 years or so. And it could be the case that that is why there is such enormous difference in most societies, depending on your age. If you are getting your media from a variety of sources, primarily through the internet, uh, but again, a variety of sources, yeah. uh, and you're radicalized through that, you're never going to be radicalized through any of the mainstream media sources. And it, it, from and there's a, a guy who lives in England who is associated with, with our group. And he said, you know, uh, he met people when he was canvassing and they'd never even heard of the idea of redistribution of wealth. They had no concept of it. They, they just was not explained to them. They had zero class consciousness. It's because they were never given that. Um, so far away from where the narrative is. You know, miles away. And I think in the end, may, and it's, it's depressing for, for many reasons. Obviously, the climate's not going to wait around for us to fucking figure this out. Um, you know, some would say it's too late anyway. But anyway, assuming it's not, you know, the, the clock is a ticking for when that kind of balance changes. You have people who, you know, who are, um, you know, certainly below the age of 40, mid 30s, downwards, who are now getting wholly their information through, again, online sources. Twitter or whatever. Yeah. yeah, from and mostly liberal left leaning stuff. And you have people who are getting it from Murdoch really <laughs> Fox News and yeah. Sky and, and the tabloids in Britain and the the clock is is ticking as to you know when that pans out when the AOC for example in Britain in America or Mary Black or who come you know coming out of you know again what you're allowed to say Mary Black it's Mary Black's alright yeah. she's cool yeah. Yeah, I like Mary or Black or speech was really cool yeah. she's alright or you know uh, just as an example uh, uh, of, of a generation that's coming in to politics at the yeah moment. I mean, like, Twitter obviously sees, unlike other big media establishments, obviously see um, the democratisation of the media as an issue. Yeah. Um, which is why they shut down en masse left-wing Twitter accounts. Yeah. Um, as soon as that narrative starts to be, starts to gain momentum, mm. um, just shut it down. So yeah. there was that, like, Mogmentum thing where Jacob Rees-Mogg was caught <laughs> in the Houses of Parliament. Um and like there was all those parody memes and everyone yeah. that tweeted a parody meme of Jacob Rees-Mogg had their Twitter account closed including me really yeah I mean Fuck I think I probably hell. can't 
So like that probably didn't help. That probably didn't help. I think I said something like, "What an entitled, born to rule cunt." Um, to be fair, there's been an awful lot of fascists who've said worse and not had their accounts right. removed. I mean, in in relation to the rest of my tweets, that wasn't even that bad, mm. and like they shut it down for that reason. And yeah. I like I kind of queried this. I was like, "What was the grounds on which this was shut yeah. down?" It wasn't expressing any sort of like hate crime. It wasn't. Yeah. Um, what was the other one? Harassment. I hadn't done it more mm. than once. Um, why was my Twitter account locked? And I didn't get a response. Because you had the wrong opinion. For like, I think seven weeks, and then eventually I gave up and just deleted my yeah. Twitter. Um, there which you is go. how they get you. We've got a Twitter account now, don't we? That we do. One. Yeah, that's cool. We do, yeah. You can use it if you like. Oh, excellent. I can, uh, this, is not, this is not <laughs> the conversation we're having right now. Re- uh, call Jacob we'll Spider-Man. start that out later. We're in this fifth circle of hell. We'd have no reception down here. Yeah, okay. um, yeah so basically, I think these things are just examples of how toxic I mean it is even toxic by I mean and, global standards well maybe not by American standards know. or by Russian I standards I mean the, the US Guardian told off the UK Guardian for being too right wing and too transphobic yeah it's true so like the United States were telling off the UK yeah no it's, it's just true kind of paper no I mean I think it's you know I mean, Britain the UK well that's, you know, both those things are wrong to say England I think is going through a a long term kind of transformation from a country which was built around the British Empire that collapsed certainly in the fifties and sixties. Um, you had a the post war settlement began to be destroyed by Thatcher. You had a kind of period of about 20 or 30 years under John Major and under Blair and under um, Brown where things roughly speaking stayed the same it didn't get any worse but it was still pretty bad Yeah. and Cameron and Osborne began austerity and Boris Johnson has done what he's done I think it is a transformation and you're basically seeing the, the, the long term collapse of the UK into its separate parts so they just can't understand themselves anymore because no, not, no. they are not a big deal anymore, and they They're still not, act no. as if they are. Well, it, one way yeah. to pretend you are is instead of like becoming a fringe country mm. on the European Union, is to tell the European Union to fuck off. Yeah, that way you can pretend you've had the power. You're like, I've True. got the power here. I'm telling you. And, to a, and anyone who contravenes that, if you're Meghan Markle or if you're Corbyn or if you're anybody, if you step in any way out of line, you will be savaged by media. Yeah. And I, I think. If anything, I think there's a large amount of people who, on on a very le- le- guttural level, understand that now. And I think in in many ways, I have a friend, I can't remember who, who said it, maybe it was you actually, that said it, um, that someone who they knew in the BBC was saying that the uh, the viewing figures for Newsnight and stuff are, 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 have plummeted since the election. Um, I think that wasn't me, but that is true as well. I think I saw that last um, week. And I, I, I think, I mean, I like Emily Maitlis. I think she's a a, a nice person but uh, and, a, and a capable journalist and I certainly don't think Paxman was better uh, I think Paxman was an annoying fucking yeah it is twat. like an old, old man that's yeah like it's young, like, shut the people. fuck up yeah. yeah shut the fuck up um, but that said I think quite clearly that they do the government a great service by the way they behave to the opposition by, yeah. by any type of view at all they don't spend any of the amount of time and but they, and they will no doubt have spent an enormous amount of time about Meghan Markle which says everything you really need to know which is that they are the handmaidens they're the courtiers they're courses not courtesans courtiers courtiers right courtesans is something else <laughs> uh, courtiers of of power they don't, they're not really interested in in uh, speaking truth to power they're not they're there to buttress the it. status quo yeah yeah basically and Meghan Markle contravened it so Good luck to her in Canada. Hopefully, One of my colleagues you know. gave me an interesting um, answer as to why the BBC had become so right wing. Apparently, it's a response to having the funding cut. Um, they're scared it's going to happen more. But also, um, rather than hiring their own journalists to do their own investigation, um, they can just hire people to do like a paper review, essentially. So if you yeah. watch like the BBC at like one o'clock in the morning, which being a nerd, I sometimes do. Mm. Um, they normally just have like two rent gobs on talking about what other papers are saying. Yes. And that's really cheap. It is. Because then you don't need to do your own journalism. You can yes. just talk about someone else's journalism. That's true. And if most journalism in the UK is like right wing or far right wing now, um, then the thing you're going to be reporting and repeating is a far right wing view. That's true. And on that rather depressing note, yeah. uh, that's our section. Excellent. <laughs> I 
I see a little silhouette of a man. I am not going to sing back to you. <laughs> Under no circumstances. 